welcome to a brand new episode of the American Armenian. I'm your host, Gabriel Killian, and joining me for episode number five is actor and filmmaker Michael Gorgian. I first discovered Michael when I was in high school and I watched the movie SLC Punk. I loved the movie and I was thrilled to see a fellow Armenian actor uh, in a big movie like that. At the time, I wanted to be an actor, so it was great to see a fellow Armenian in like a pretty big movie like that. I was happy to see an Armenian actor in the movie and he did a really great job with the character. So... Um, I was really impressed. And all these years later, I got to know him and did an interview with him, which I hope you guys enjoy. For anyone who wants to catch me live doing stand-up comedy, this Wednesday, I'll be in San Diego. Friday, I'll be in Burbank. And next Friday, I'll be in Burbank again. So check my Instagram, at Gabe Killian, for all the information there. And enjoy the episode. So I am an American Armenian Representing both nations in the media And can you hear the sound of hysteria? The subliminal mind blown America All right. Welcome to a new kind of tension All across the alien nations Everything isn't meant to be okay Television dreams of tomorrow We're not the ones who went to follow For all that's enough to argue Hey Mike, how you doing? Good, how are you? Not bad, bro, not bad uh, Where you at, you home? Yeah Yeah I was going to be in my wife's office, but then I, I was able to make it home. So, nice. Uh, how was your weekend? Pretty good. Uh, I was in uh, Connecticut, um, Mystic, Connecticut, for a film festival there. Um, and it went went well. Uh, we won some awards, and that was fun. So, yeah, I saw your Instagram post, man. Congratulations. It's pretty dope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, where were you born and raised? Uh, San Francisco. I was born in San Francisco, but I grew up primarily in Oakland, um, across the bay. Uh, was there an Armenian community out there where you grew up? Uh, yeah. Although I didn't know any of them. Um, I, my dad was uh, my dad was a scientist, so um, we never went to church. And I think most Armenians up here kind of know each other through church. So. I knew, you know, I had relatives and stuff, but it wasn't until I got a little older that I, I met some of the, the community up here. Uh, this last movie you, you made, Amiri Gatsi, that was filmed in Armenia, right? Yeah, yeah. Was that your first time going there, or had you been before? Um, no, I had been before. Um, are we doing the po- Are we already podcasting? Yeah, yeah. Are we taking place? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, uh, let's see, I went to Armenia in, um, 2006 for the first time, um, sort of for the Golden Apricot Film Festival. I had a, a film that was in it. Um, uh, but me, it was me and a, a journalist friend of mine and we, uh, uh, got there, oh God, we got there a little bit before the festival, um, and traveled around and. Uh, it, it was it was crazy because the um, the film we the film I made we showed to the minister of culture and uh, actually it was the deputy minister of culture at the time who has the same last name as me and when he saw the film he you know he really liked it and was like well we're related so the whole time I was there it was like uh, you know black limousine cars taking us all over the place and big dinners and they awesome. they they really uh yeah it was a lot of fun so yeah that was the first time and then um for Amaragatsi we uh I went back in 2018 um the end of 2018 to scout and meet actors and uh 
meet production people. And then uh, a year later, end of 2019, um, like a few days before New Year's, I flew out with my wife and my son. Uh, and then we did pre-production. They went home uh, after about a month and they were meant to come back out. Uh, from, uh, my wife's a professor um, during spring break uh, in March and then stay with me for the rest of the shoot. But then the pandemic hit. So uh, we, uh, uh, they, the travel ban kicked in and I ended up getting, I was stuck there. They were stuck here. Uh, and then um, when we shot, we, we ended up shooting. I was there for probably eight months. About. So what's the earliest you think people will be able to see it? Well, we're going to continue going to festivals. We'll be in a festival in Toronto, the uh, Palm Festival, uh, in a few weeks. And then another one in Montreal. Uh, those are both Armenian festivals. Um, then we have, it's a, the holidays probably won't be doing too much. Uh, but then we're going to be traveling around to a bunch of different festivals. Um, we have not made a distribution deal yet. We're talking to different uh, companies right now. But my guess is it would be um, like spring of next year. It'll come out in theaters. Uh, but before then, we're going to be doing a lot of screenings at festivals. And in Los Angeles, we'll probably do, you know, quite a few screenings down there in the in the coming months. So. I can't wait to see it, man. Uh, can you tell me about the movie and how you came up with the idea for it? Well, it's uh, it takes place in 1947 to the mid-1950s. It's basically, um, there was a repatriation movement. Uh, Stalin invited Armenians from the diaspora to basically come back to Armenia or come to Soviet Armenia to help rebuild it after the war. Um, and there was a lot of propaganda that went out um, showing, you know, uh, Armenia is this incredible place and communism is fantastic. And, and a lot of people went and it wasn't, for most of them, it wasn't the best experience. Um, the, when they got there, there was a lot of fighting between the highest on sea and, and the, they, they call them Akbars. Um, and uh, so anyways, the film that I made takes place during that period, but it's, it's more, that's kind of the setting of it but it's primarily about a prisoner and a guard and um, the relationship between the two of them. Um, I, the reason uh, the, the particular, this particular story and um, why I decided to do it. Are you still there? Yeah. Oh, okay. You disappeared. So I wasn't sure <laughs> there you are. Um, you know, there've been a lot of films, uh, Ar Armenian films that mostly you know, focus on the genocide, which is very important. Um, but I wanted to try to make something that was a little more, um, well, two things, one, something that was hopeful. Um, and then the other, something that was easier for Armenians to share with others, um, for us to be able to share our culture with, with non-Armenians. Um, I think sometimes some of the stuff that gets made if you're Armenian it's interesting but uh if you're not Armenian a lot of people don't really care or don't want to see it so I really try to find a story that was more universal um and that seems to be pretty much uh working out with you know the festivals that we've been to uh Woodstock Hamburg our, our audiences are primarily non-Armenians and they seem to love it um it's you know we've won a lot of awards and, and it works for, you don't have to be Armenian to like the movie, but it exposes people to um, a lot of aspects of our culture uh, and our language. The, the film is in Armenian and Russian and English. Um, and it was shot in Armenia. The, the, uh, the um, uh, Philharmonic, uh, National Philharmonic did the score, um, composed the score to the film. So it, it's a way of really sharing kind of, our culture, who we are, and our artists, the actors, the musicians, all the all the people that made the film are Armenian. Armenian, and and uh, for me, uh, that's kind of the the strongest thing that I felt I could do as an artist uh, in terms of 
helping uplift our culture. But then also for me, it was uh, getting to shoot in Armenia was a gift. It was wonderful. I mean, even though it was, there was a pandemic going on, um, I got to work with some incredible people over there. And uh, I hope it encourages other Armenians to do the same and, and go shoot films there because it's, it's there's a lot of opportunity there that uh, creatively speaking, there's a lot that can be done there. So definitely agree. And I really can't wait to see the movie, man. Um, how did you get into character for it? Uh, well, was <laughs> I, I play a prisoner stuck in a, a cell and, you know, with the pandemic going on, it was pretty, uh, <laughs> it was uh, <laughs> not too hard to imagine i mean we joked about <laughs> the crew wanted to they were like hey mike you're, you're kind of a method actor you should just go live on the on the in the cell <laughs> get into character a lot of the aspects of the character i play are uh, close to who i am um and really reflect i think things that um other Armenians that from be, being part of a diaspora where you have a, there, there's this homeland, this place out there that uh, you haven't been or you, you hear about or you, you know, there's a lot of idealization of what that is. And so that aspect was a part of me and a part of the character. Um, and then meeting the reality of what was going on, um, you know, that that was somewhat true as well, uh, getting there. And, you know, the, the story has sort of two components to it. There is the experience of the um, repatriate, the character I play, coming back to a homeland, looking for his roots, longing to connect in some way. But then in the story, um, not to give too much away, but basically the, the basis of it is um, I'm in a prison cell and I happen to be able to see out the cell window. I can see through a hole in the prison wall into an apartment building nearby the prison. And there's a man living there with his wife. And most of the movie, I'm watching them. And I learn all sorts of things about them and about their lives. And, and it turns out the, the guy living there is actually a guard at the prison. Um, and that story, it's played by um, Hovik. Kushkarian, who is a Spanish Armenian actor who's on a he was on a big show called Money Heist and um, phenomenal, phenomenal actor. Um, his this character is uh, someone who was living under the Soviet uh, regime and the Armenians that live there under the Soviet regime, their story and what they went through in terms of having their culture stripped away and they were russified and, and so many things that they struggled, I think as a, uh, someone from the West is part of the diaspora, understanding their story, uh, was, is, is helpful, I think. Uh, and it, so to me, that component was something that I learned and developed while I was there shooting, many of the people that worked on the film had lived, you know, had grown up during the Soviet Union and knew things and brought stuff into the film, details and textures that um, really made the film a much wholer uh, piece of art. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers your question in a long way. Uh, what year does the movie take place again? 1930 what? Uh, 19, well, it begins in like 1947, 1948. Yeah, there was actually, so repatriation, there was several movements of it. Um, it started actually even before then, but there was a period right after World War, um, two ended where Stalin had a lot of propaganda that went out and people repatriated from France and from Syria and from Lebanon. And, uh, and then there was, in 1947 uh, and 48, I believe, there were two ships that came from America, about 300 um, Armenian Americans repatriated. Oh. And then when they got there, it was really rough. Things There was no housing. There was a, a, a lot of people were being arrested already, sent to Siberia. The, the things that they brought from the West, people brought 
things to help the country, like, uh, you know, equipment and money and, uh, you know, people brought automobiles and the Soviets just took everything, um, took it all away. And so after those first two, after those two boats, uh, made it there from America, repatriation, the word got out, basically, this is not, (laughs) uh, it's not what it seems. And so repatriation sort of fell off for a while. After Stalin died, um, there was a period where things loosened up enough that some Armenians were, people were able to leave again. But then in the 60s, 70s, there were other repatriation movements of people coming back. So it, it, it changed slightly. But this was one particular period that was very rough. And there's not many people know about it, um, even Armenians. It's a period of our history that's never really been talked about much. Um, and for me as a filmmaker, that's not really my motivation. I don't, I don't, I didn't make this film to teach people about history per se. It just was a period and a time that made sense for the the story that I wanted to tell, which is much more about um, the main characters and, and that situation. I know my grandfather repatriated from Greece. I think it was in mm-hmm. the 30s or 40s or something. Uh, they escaped the genocide and while they were escaping it was just him and his dad and he was like an infant and his dad thought he wasn't going to survive so he just uh, dumped him in the grass in a field somewhere and he left him and uh, overnight he, he regretted it so he went back looking for him and he found him sleeping and uh, oh, wow and he, and if he if he was not a quiet baby if he was crying or something they would have found him and killed him so it's kind of yeah miracle that he survived Wow. I just recently heard that story and it was pretty uh, it's pretty wild. Yeah, man. There's so many incredible stories uh about people surviving the genocide uh, and then repatriation is ju- to me is just another it's like how many things can we go through? <laughs> how many how many struggles? How many uh how many hardships? But that's kind of what the movie is about as well is um you know there's the the uh William Soroyan quote about you know you can uh destroy our churches do this do that and you know as long as any two armenians meet a new armenia is born and that that to me that is kind of at the heart of what the film is about is um you know if we have something that we can it's less about, you know, looking at the rest of the world as Armenians and going, hey, give us attention, give us, we deserve, no, we have to look at it as what can we give to the rest of the world? What do Armenians have to give? And one thing that we have to give is that we know how to survive. We know how to, and my grandfather taught me this, and that's what, I mean, my character is somewhat based on. He said, no matter what, you just, you, you nobody can take your smile away from you. That's and no matter what happens, you you can find that other Armenian and uh, a new Armenia is born. So I think to me that's under underneath the, this film and the, what it's all about is 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 that is trying to help uh, trying to use art to help. Uh, help show other Armenian artists, hey, let's lead by um, giving and giving and and showing that we have something to give to the rest of the world. So, yeah. Couldn't agree more. Do you keep up to date with uh, what's going on in Armenia? I I mean, it's hard. (laughs) It's like every day. um, I was joking with um, uh, Serge Tankian is a producer on the film and I saw him at an event uh, recently. And, you know, every time I said, Hey, how you doing? And, and I looked at him and he had this look, I'm like, Oh God, did something else happen in the hour that I haven't checked, you know, <laughs> social media, what else happened in our media? So seems, I mean, things have calmed down a little bit since then, but, um, yeah, I mean, man, it's crazy, it's crazy what's going on. So uh, how did you get into acting and film? I, uh, in junior high, I went to a pretty rough school in Oakland and, um, 
I they had an announcement on the PA that if anybody wanted to audition for some community theater thing to come to the front office. And so I basically did it to get out of class and I got the role. And uh, I did, <laughs> from that, I did, uh, I enjoyed it. And then I started doing plays in high school. And, um, and then I went to uh, uh, UCLA, the theater department, UCLA. And about, well, I think it was halfway through my first year, I, I booked a, a job. There was an audition for a dance, uh, for a dancer, to be a dancer. And I, I'm not a trained dancer or anything, but I was like, you know, what the heck, I'll try. Uh, and I got it. And then it led to working. Uh, my first sort of big thing that I did was a movie called Newsies, which was like a, a musical. Um, and they, the way they did that film, it was like the old days and they, they just had us on contract. So uh, for, you know, I think close to nine months, I was just work, you know, working, uh, even if we weren't shooting, I would show up to set at the back lot of universal and just hang out and, uh, be there. So, um, that was my first sort of big job. And I, as a dancer, and then from that, I moved in, into acting. But and so when we were making Newsies, this is a little fun side note. Uh, one of the guys had a camera and it was like an old, this is, a, this is a while ago. It was a VHS camera where you put a VHS in and you, you know. Um, and me and this other actor, this guy, Max Casella, we decided we were kind of bored. We were like, let's make our own movie. So we made a horror movie called blood drips on newsy square and um we did it just kind of as a joke for fun but then everybody got into it and like christian bales in it and bill pullman and robert duvall uh, like all these all the main people that were in newsies saw us making a movie and they were like oh we want to be in the horror movie so <laughs> we made this uh you know little video horror movie that uh called blood drips and apparently on imdb we have higher ratings than Newsies itself. So that was my first directorial debut, I guess. Is there anywhere to watch that? I think you can find it on YouTube. I'm oh. pretty sure it's on YouTube. I think there, uh, there were, uh, an editor of mine was, we had made it and then um, forgot about it. And years later, I was working with an editor who found it on a VHS tape in like a box of mine. And he was like, you know, there's a lot of Newsies fans out at, out there. They they probably want to see this. So he had put it like was selling DVDs of it or something. Um, but now I think it's on YouTube. I think. Uh, I was looking over your credits and I noticed you were in Forever Young with Mel Gibson and Elijah Wood. Uh, who'd you play in that? Were you Elijah Wood's friend in the beginning? Uh, I played Elijah Wood's. Uh, Elijah Wood's brother or Elijah Wood's friend's brother. Okay. So like him and his brother, I'm in the army and he's hanging out with his brother and I take him with me to some army base and that's where they find Mel Gibson or something like that. Okay, yeah, I remember like, that. Yeah, yeah. What was that experience like? Uh you know, it was fun. It was uh Mel Gibson is was a interesting fellow. <laughs> um, you know, it was a, a, a I don't know, maybe a cameo, you know, a few days work uh, in Warner Brothers. It was fun. You also played Charlie Chaplin Jr. in the Academy Award winning movie Chaplin. What was that experience like? Um, that was fun. You know, unfortunately, most of the stuff I did got cut out of the movie, not because I was bad, but they just uh the section of the movie I was in they trimmed it down yeah. um so I'm still in there a bit but um yeah uh it was I, I Richard Attenborough directed it he's a very famous older director was I think he's passed away I'm pretty sure um uh and uh I just remember I had to wear a wool suit in Pasadena outside in like 100 degree weather and they they wanted my character to smoke cigarettes, but they had to be like 
the kind from back then, which were unfiltered. And this director was notorious for doing lots of takes. So I had to smoke, chain smoke these filterless cigarettes <laughs> in a wool suit. I got so sick. I was in my trailer puking like for an hour. Uh, um, I used to, that was for a, a big blockbuster movie. I did it for a studio film when I was, I mean, I did it for a student film when I was in high school. <laughs> Same experience. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you had to do that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's when you're on set, you're like, "Yeah, sure, I could do that. Yeah, I'll I'll jump over the shark. I'll do that." Yeah, <laughs> sometimes, yeah, it doesn't pan out. All right, let's talk about SLC Punk. I just rewatched that movie yesterday. Um, it's one of my favorite movies. I love you in it, man. Uh, you do a really good job. How, Thank, you. How did, Thank you. How did that movie come into your life? Uh. I just auditioned for it, you know, but it was in the nineties and there was a lot of independent films getting made then. Um, and just something I came across and the audition, the director, James Verandino was, uh, I liked him a lot. You know, he, he was into improvising and, and, you know, he was more unconventional and like to like to play around. So we got along good. And, um, Pretty sure I originally I auditioned for the other for Stevo. I think everybody did, and then he kind of like put people in different places. But uh, yeah, that was a great great film to work on. Um, Matt Lillard's a really fun actor to work with. So yeah, him, Devin Sawa, uh, uh, Jason Siegel. That's a great cast, man. Do you keep in touch with any of those guys? Um. You know, sort of, you know, I'll say hi to them through social media here and there. Um, uh, Robert, uh, Jimmy Duvall, um, he's he's a great, uh, I, I like that guy a lot. Uh, yeah, here and there, here and there. Yeah, that movie's got a big following, I guess, because when I mentioned uh, on Instagram that I was having you on, a lot of people responded that they were looking forward to to this episode like people from ages like 19 to like 50 like it's crazy <laughs> Armenians and non armenians man like yeah was, quite well nice. SLC, slc punk is a real unique special film because it you know it's a it's about an era and music and all that but it's actually a pretty deep film like and james the director who also wrote it he's a smart guy um, and that script, it just kind of hits a nerve, I think, because it's, there's something, you know, it's playful and, and fun and stupid and silly, but there's something about it that real really nails something deep, I think. What was it like playing the character of Heroin Bob? Uh, pretty fun. You know, in a way, I, my, you know, my character's supposed to kind of, he, it, a lot of the characters are, they're based on uh, real people um, or characters, p people that were known in Salt Lake City in that period in the 80s. Um, but uh, and he, you know, the guy, uh, Heron Bob, was based on was obsessed with Robert De Niro. Like the look was kind of, you know, because he's based on Taxi Driver. Um, but as far as like the character. Really, I was kind of just doing a bad imitation of the director, James Marantino. Because <laughs> that's like how he talks. <laughs> like that. That's funny. Yeah. Uh, I was surprised to see that you were a serious regular on Party of Five, which uh, many of the young listeners probably don't know was a big Fox show in the 90s. Can you tell me about that experience? Yeah. I mean... Um, a lot of my jobs that I've had have been like this, where it was, uh, I, I just was hired as a, a one episode, like a guest spot, um, to play. Uh, I don't know. I, I can't remember the first episode. I was kind of somebody that Nev Campbell dates or something it goes on a date with, and then they liked me a lot. So they kept bringing me back, bringing me back. And then I became a regular on the show. Um, it was great. Uh, I, you know, it's, I was young at the time and, and didn't really, uh, it, well, I'll say this. 
uh, of all the actors that I've worked with, Nev Campbell is still one of my closest friends. I'm the godfather to her kids. Uh, uh, she's a, a wonderful, wonderful person. And, um, outside of, outside of her, the rest of the cast as well, it was a unique experience in terms of there was a lot of great people working together. Um, and we were all young at the time. And, um, so, but, you know, I was pretty lucky in terms of having that early in my career as kind of a foundation to build on. Are there any shows that you've been binging on? You know, I, I don't have time to do that anymore. Jeez. I mean, I, and I'm kind of glad too. I, rem, you know, I think the last thing that I got, I did that on was like, I don't know, a good five, six years ago. Um, and they just suck you in. Just take all your time and attention. It's like, ah, get me out of this this labyrinth of of going. God, I got to see the next episode. Got to see. It. Um, I haven't been watching anything. Uh, I I I miss like just movies where you can like watch one and then get out and you're done. <laughs> what do you do on long flights? Uh, I watch. Uh, that I haven't watched that I, I missed mm -hmm. um, and I pretend like I'm going to do some work but I never do I always bring a laptop and I'm like I'm going to write I'm going to work on my new script I'm going to and I never do what about reading are you much of a reader yes I am a I read a lot a lot are there any books you would recommend uh, well I could give you a long list Give me an give me an uh, a general area uh, of interest, and I'll tell you what to read. Uh, what do you? Just generally off the top of your head, for my audience, uh, maybe maybe basic self help or general. Any the average person would either find entertaining, entertaining or useful. Oh boy! Well, uh, I it would be too hard for me to uh, narrow it down too much. Why don't I, um, <laughs> let me see? Uh, I I, uh, I don't want to get too. Um, oh, you got a library behind you. Huh? Uh, oh, uh, my house is a library. We have <laughs> bookcases everywhere. Um, you know, I have. Uh, I'd say um, I'll just give you one. Um, one that I think. Uh, uh, let me see. Well. I, okay, in terms of novelists, I've always been a big fan of Murakami, um, Haruki Murakami. Um, uh, I like, what am I reading right now? I'm reading a book about um, uh, the uh, the master and his emissary. It's about the, the two hemispheres of the brain. So that's a little too crazy. But um, how about, well, I'll give you a few, like, well, I wrote a novel. How about that? Do I have a copy here somewhere? It's called What Lies Beyond the Stars. Um, What's that about? It is. You should read it. Is it on Amazon? Yep. Yep. Um, I could go get a copy. Is this a is this a um, audio uh, podcast or is it video as well? It's video, but I'm probably going to release audio too for like iTunes and stuff. Oh, okay. Well, if you give me one second, I'll go grab a copy of my book. Hold on. What Lies Beyond the Stars by Michael Gurdjian. Um, when did that come out? 2016, I think. Um, and I'm supposed to write a sequel, but um, I got halfway through the sequel, and then I was like, you know what? I want to go direct a film instead. So <laughs> I, I ended up going to make America. So hopefully I'll get back to writing my second book, but uh, uh, it is, well, uh, I'll, you can check it out. You'll like it. I'll just, okay. just leave you with that. Yeah. Uh, are you thinking about turning that into a screenplay? It actually was a screenplay. Um, it's a screenplay that I've been working on for probably 25 years. And, um, at various time, one point I was going to make it with, uh, Michelle Williams was attached, uh, to it and then it all fell apart. And then again, it, one of those, you know, Hollywood, you know, nightmares where 
all the everything it's about to happen and then it all fell apart um so i had done some work for a publishing company called hay house um i had directed several films one of them um if you want self-help kind of stuff there's a movie called um the shift starring uh wayne dyer and uh portia de rossi and a bunch of other actors are in it um it's quite good you can find it online i'm probably even find it on youtube or something um that's a film that i directed for them uh it's a narrative film but it's it's um it's very good um so working with hay house they asked they would they were uh they brought some people in from i think uh random house or something they were starting a fiction division they had done just non-fiction mostly self-help non-fiction books and they wanted to do more fiction. And so the uh, head of the company asked if I had anything that I thought could be a novel. And I showed him the script that I've been working on forever. And he said, well, what do you think about making it into a novel? So that's what I did. Um, yes, I would someday very much like to make the film. Um, but I, it, it felt right to take a break from it. Um, you know, when you work on something that long, it can lose, you You know, it, it, it becomes dead in a way. And I think with some, by going to Armenia, making a film, looking at other stuff, maybe, you know, when it's time to do it, I'll do it. And, uh, and it hopefully will come back to life for me. So it's something I, it's a great, the the story is something I care a lot about. So hopefully that'll happen at some point. Is it something that would require a massive budget? No, no. But that's the problem is, is that nowadays with funding, with films and everything, uh, either you're making something with, you know, a superhero in it, or uh, it's very hard to make smaller films um, get to get them financed unless you have, you know, a big actor in it or, and, I could with this, you know, hopefully I uh will find the right situation for it. Um but it's not a genre piece, it's not horror or uh action. So making films that are more intellectual or um it's just it's become difficult in the United States to find funding for films like that. Are you familiar with Brooklyn based novelist Arthur Narcissian? All right, I'm going to recommend a book for you. No. Yeah, please do. I try to read as many Armenians as I can. Uh, but what's this guy's name? Arthur Nersesian. And uh, the book is called The Fuck Up. Okay. The check fuck it up. out. I will check it out. Arthur Nersesian. Sounds good. All right. Uh, what are your favorite movies of all time? Uh, probably my favorite movie would be uh, Being There. Uh, it's with Peter Sellers. I don't think I've seen it. That's definitely, I would say, it's what I usually tell people when they ask what's your favorite movie. Uh, but I like, I mean... I like a lot of stuff. I like, you know, everything from Raiders of the Lost Ark to Tarkovsky. So I'm all over the place. Um, what's the best compliment you've ever received? Mm. Ah, I Well, the first thing that came to mind was um, I was in a play. I was in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest in high school. I played Billy Bivett, who's the, the guy who stutters, who commits suicide. And after like the, there's a big scene in the, uh, in the play. Uh, and after I went off, I remember being backstage trying to like going to like get, I, I forget, you know, I think I had to put, take some makeup off or some blood, do something. And I overheard, um, stage manager and uh, and like one of the other actors talking about me and saying that guy's good that guy's don't so that meant a lot what they you know i don't know i don't remember what exactly they said but 
Um, I'm not the most boastful person in the world. Um, and to hear other people talk about you, not knowing that you're, you're, you hear, can, you're listening to them. That meant a tremendous amount, gave me a lot of confidence, I think, uh, to, to feel like, okay, you know, I can be an actor. Um, so. Nice. Uh, what motivates you? What motivates me as an artist, I would say, is um, I have always felt a great joy uh, in creating stuff. I don't really care what I'm doing, if I'm acting or directing or writing or um, when something's good. Like I, I feel it. I, I love I love being a part of something that I think is good, creatively good. Um, and what that means to me is not just it's artistically good, but it's also I love to be involved in project, projects that are putting something into the world that makes the world better or uh, reflects the better side of humanity. Um, I think there's so much nowadays, especially that's uh, being created that's, you know, it's about a serial killer or like the drug family and that's the, you know, how the world's falling apart and these politicians are destroying stuff and, you know, we're destroying the environment. And it's, it's good to, you know, make media about the problems in the world. That's important, but it just feels like everything, you know, I, that's part of why I can't binge things anymore because it's all, everything is about like how terrible we are as human beings. I, I feel like I'm drawn towards making things that uh, somehow lift, uplift um, humanity and, and inspire, uh, inspire other people. Um, because those are the things that have meant the most to me uh, in my uh, creatively speaking. So. Nice. All right, I'm gonna throw a curveball in there. Uh, do, oh, you yeah, have, do, uh, do you have any street fight stories? Street fight stories. Um, I don't think I've ever been on a. I mean, I've been in fights, but not on the street. <laughs> really? I've uh, yeah. Uh, I always I'm too nice. I guess I, I'm I'm just too nice. I don't uh, you know. My I try to avoid I, violence. I, by street, I mean outside of a martial arts environment. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, no, I don't have any street fight stories. Sorry. Have you done uh, martial? Uh, I when I was younger, um, uh, I really liked jujitsu. Um, oh I follow it, uh, um, but I I don't practice. Um, but I do follow martial arts. I I wa I mean, there seems to be a lot of Armenians in like MMA and like Armenians are good at that stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, <laughs> I think that's what started me. I saw, I think it was Edward Shabazian or someone like that. I was like, Hey, that guy's good. Yeah. He's a and fan. I started of, watching. He's got Edmund Shabazian. He's got a fight coming up in December. Oh, good. Yeah. He hasn't, he hasn't fought in a while. Yeah. Like, a layoff. Yeah. Getting better. Good. Good, good man. All right. Uh, let me get a little personal. How did you meet your wife? Uh, well, where most people meet their wives at a, uh, a circus, uh, we met through, a, a mutual friend who's a, a Ukrainian, uh, uh, clown, the okay. magician slash clown. Yeah. Yeah. Him and his, you have Jenny Verona and him and his wife, his wife's a contortionist. And, uh, I was friend, I'm friends with Yevgeny and, uh, there was a circus in San Francisco. It's like uh, Teatro uh, Zanzani is um, like uh, like Cirque du Soleil kind of. Um, so I went to the, I went to the tent to visit my friend and and take him uh, take him out for a drink and uh, my wife was there for her birthday and uh, so we met we met at the circus. Is your wife Ukrainian? No, no, she's. Uh, She's French and Portuguese. Oh, nice. Brazilian, huh? <laughs> well, not Brazilian. Portuguese, Portuguese. Oh, or Portugal. Yeah, yeah, my bad, yeah. my bad. Yeah. That's the language. Yeah. Uh, that's cool, that's cool. Um, 
Are you a bad guy? Do you take bats? Baths? Yeah, bats. Like, take bats. I thought you had bats, like baseball bats. Um, do I take bats? Uh, I like them every once in a while, but it's not my, I wouldn't say it's my daily routine or anything. I right. like, um, I like uh, cold showers. They wake you up. Uh, do you have a morning routine? Uh, I have a morning routine depending on where I'm at. If I'm in LA, if I'm in San Francisco, if I'm traveling here. Um, yeah, my morning routine really revolves around my son. Getting him to school, getting him ready, uh, dealing with our dog, that kind of stuff. What if you're on the road? I'm on the road. I usually, here's a trick I learned early is, you the first day you are in a new place if you can just set a routine the very first day then it will always you always have it so whenever i go to a new place i'll go jogging in the morning first thing in the morning uh and this is true so like when i was in armenia i would go jogging every morning and especially during the pandemic when it was locked down you know we were only allowed to leave to go shopping or to uh exercise it's the only reason you could leave your your house so i would go jogging for like two hours through yerevan i know i know the city center better than people that live there like i know every alleyway everything because i would just jog every single day uh but when i went back uh, this year for the golden amber cup film festival i got there and, you know, regardless of jet lag, anything, I woke up in the morning and right away I was like, put on my shoes, I went for a jog. So it was just ingrained in me. That's my routine. So. And uh, I got to try that because usually when I go someplace new, like the first day, all I do is sleep all day. <laughs> I know. See, that's the problem. You got to you got to knock it in the first day you get there. Whatever it is that you want to do, you got to get set it the first day. Yeah. Man. Uh, do you cook? Uh, not well. Uh, I I cook like five things well, and then the rest I rely on other people. Is your wife a good cook? A, she's an excellent cook. I'm a good sous chef. Okay. I'm good at being told told what to do in the kitchen. Chop this, move that. <laughs> All right. This is my favorite question. <laughs> I haven't asked anyone yet. Do you have any ghost stories or any paranormal experiences? Okay, well, the first thing that comes to mind, this is totally weird, and it's the only one that I can think of right now. I'm sure I have others, but I remember in like fifth or sixth grade, this weird, it sounds hella weird, we were over at my buddy uh, Chris Beam's house. And he lived like his room was in the basement of his parents' house. And we were all, me and him and a bunch of people were over there. And I think maybe it was like a sleepover or something. But uh, we, uh, his room, he had an Apocalypse Now poster on the wall. And then a, another poster of like some vampire movie, something. I remember we all were freaked out because we had like, like we're hanging out, whatever. And someone noticed there was, um, looked like drips of like blood or ink all over the poster and the walls. And they weren't there like earlier. And somehow like we had saw like all these drips of like ink. On, uh, it looked like black. It was like blackish reddish on his poster on the walls. And it definitely wasn't there like earlier that, that evening and we noticed it we we're like what the rat oh my god so i remember that i'm sure there is some real world explanation for it but it freaked us out <laughs> for sure <laughs> I know, man. i've seen some stuff there's no explanation for it, so that's why i'm curious yeah it's a new question i'm starting to ask people <laughs> yeah i like that question it's a good one yeah all right, uh, before we get out of here, uh, besides the movie coming out and the book you got out, is there anything else you'd want to plug? Uh, well, 
no, not not anything. Um, I mean, the film. Um, hopefully, it's going to be available in various ways, but uh, eventually. Right now, we're just doing the festival circuit. Um, but I think it's. Uh, I'll let you know when we have a screening in LA. I'll let you know uh, so you can come see it. Um, I think I, I made it. I hopefully it's something that Armenians can be proud of. I made it for for everyone to share. Um, you know, uh, something that you feel good about going, Hey, you want to know about our culture? You here, watch this movie. Um, something I, I, I hope it, I hope that's the case. So, um, oh, where can people find you on social media? Uh, on the all those little things i don't know uh instagram and where'd you find me you found me on facebook right i know <laughs> I'm, not asking, <laughs> I'm not asking for the name of the apps i mean like what's your instagram handle at, at michael gorgia oh yeah at michael Gorgi, i guess so yeah yeah um <laughs> i don't i don't really i'm not much into social media but i will i will say this when people write me like dm me or whatever i usually write back i like talking i like I don't mind talking to anybody or texting with people. I just don't like sharing about my life. <laughs> That's the part. Like taking a picture of my lunch is not. You know, <laughs> I just want to eat my lunch. I don't want to share that. Yeah. I see. All right. Well, thank you for joining me today, man. I've been a fan of yours since uh, I was a kid, pretty much, since I saw uh, SOC Punk, saw, saw your name, Gorgian. Oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, man. Wait till you see our film because you'll see the end credits. I did it especially for Armenian. <laughs> it's just one name after another after another Armenian. And at the very end, there's a little special thing because I know Armenians stick around for the credits. So, uh, yeah. Awesome, man. Thanks again for joining me. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. God bless Armenia. Stay beautiful, everyone. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Gabriel. Take care.